We have a thought leader uh, talking about scalable growth with platform integration, uh, Shrikant uh, Patathil, and I hope I haven't butchered your last name, Shrikant. Is it pronounced Patathil? Oh, perfect, perfect. Thank you. Uh, and also with uh, presenting with will be uh, panelists uh, Katrina and uh, Vendana. And I will uh, turn the, the presentation over to you at this time, Shrikant. Uh, just know that Shrikant has been a long standing leader within uh, Harbinger has been 23 years at the company uh, doing offshore software development, sales, marketing teams, in various capacity, develop software products and services for, for all types of software product companies uh, from startups to midsize, Fortune 500, the key domains in the areas of HR tech, health tech, learning tech, and ed tech. Uh, so with that, I'll turn this over to Shrikant and thank you. Uh, thanks, Steve. Uh, appreciate that uh, introduction. Uh, hello, everyone. I hope uh, all of you can hear me well. Yes. Great. Uh, so just let me, and I hope my screen is also visible. So I just shared my screen. Just my photograph, that's all. Nothing else. Yes. Cool. Thank you. So let's get started. The slide says by end of this session, but we are just starting. Um, so today, I think we're going to talk about uh, integrations and primarily uh, scalable integration. So we're going to talk initially about what are the market trends? Uh, what are we seeing out there? Uh, then we talk about, uh, you know, why do you need to invest uh, and how do you justify your investments in integrations? Uh, we will also then talk about why you need to think about integrations in a scalable way. And is there a, some sort of a checklist that you can have? Uh, and how do you go about that? And finally, the most important aspect of how uh, you, you go about building these integrations. What are the different approaches uh, out, out there? Uh, and I'm sure uh, our panelists, uh, Katrina and Vandana, will have uh, great things to share about that, uh, about these four areas. And before I bring them in into conversation, let me just give you some more idea of what, how exactly we're going to go about the whole session. So when, as product leaders or enterprises think about integrations, uh, it starts with, you know, knowing the basics, uh, thinking about, how to scale them, how to integrate it with the various applications out there, how to deploy, how, how is the whole compliance thing playing out, how the data migration things will work out, what kind of customizations will be needed and so forth. Uh, that's a lot to cover. So we'll specifically be focusing on two areas. One is why we need scalable integrations today, why is it most important, and then the how part. And that Essentially, we have broken up into four uh, topics and we'll go one section at a time. And uh, I already talked to you about why, why we're dividing this. First, the why part we'll cover and then we'll go up uh, with the how part. So just let's take a look at uh, what's the market saying. And we have put together you know, four important trends that we have seen over the last year. Uh, when you look at integrations, I think the most important trend that we see, uh, the ecosystem is so complex. So it's not just the vendors, but the buyers as well who, who depend on integrations and their strategy, uh, their success depends on how good integrations are. That's what Cloud Elements uh, uh, report says. Uh, then if you go to MuleSout, which is, who is one of the leading providers of integration uh, platforms, they said that many of the customers think that if, as long as they have the integrations, they can win more deals. I mean, that's, that's important uh, to them as well. Uh, Gartner Research says that there will be a lot of time that platforms will be investing in building uh, integrations and almost 50% uh, uh, of, of the time and cost. Uh, Almost everybody is getting into the integration game one way or the other. And we see that with the AWS as well. They launched Appflow as a platform in case 
developers want to build something from scratch, they have ability to use a platform like AppFlow, uh, orchestrate the in uh, integrations, do the data field mappings, um, and build it on their own. So, and this on this background, I think it'll be an interesting time to welcome uh, both our panelists. Uh, so, great to have Katrina uh, Pagliarani, head of sales and partnerships, Explore Your SaaS. Uh, <laughs> she's been an industry veteran, uh, a lot of experience uh, working with ISVs uh, as well as uh, enterprises on the integration space. So, uh, welcome, Katrina. Thank you. And, and we also have Vandana Agarwal, uh, VP BizDev and Strategy, Global ISP and Partnerships at SAP. Uh, she works very closely with uh, I, all the ISVs to help build uh, partnerships uh, and help them both, whether they are startups or large enterprises uh, themselves uh, in, their, in their strategy. And uh, working at SAP, I'm sure, uh, over the years, she's gained a lot of experience how SAP does it, as well as uh, what happens, how externally people are trying to solve the integration problems. So on that note, uh, let me welcome both of them. And uh, you know, Katrina, starting with you, if you can tell us a little bit more and uh, you know what specifically interests you in this topic. Sure. Um, so I work with the HR Tech Alliance and as an advisory board member. And I'm also part of the advisory team that works out of that group, um, which we're calling the Work Tech Collective of Advisors as well. Um, as an ecosystem navigator and barrier removal expert <laughs> for HR SaaS vendors, uh, I find integrations are um, one of the biggest barriers to sales and growth for our clients. And there's a lot to consider. Uh, and the direction that you take has a lot to do with your go-to-market strategy and your partnership uh, strategy. So it's a very interesting topic to me. I've dealt with small businesses, enterprise businesses, and um, as employers, and also um, ISVs in those markets as well. So it's top of mind all the time. <laughs> Thanks, Katrina. Over to you, Vandana. Oh, thank you so much, and I, thank you so much for that generous, uh, you know, introduction as well. Good to good to meet you all of you, in fact, and thank you for having me. Uh, as Shikam mentioned, you know, I, I work with SAP. Uh, I've been working with SAP for almost fourteen years now, uh, but over over uh, different um, you know topics, different roles, in fact, different continents, uh, if you will. And uh, you know, even though my primary focus all through these years has been around uh, go to market, right, and biz dev, but but also I feel that in any large organization or even a small organization, right, we all have customers that are transforming. It is very important to. Work work at the intersection, right? Uh, at the intersection of strategy, product, and sales, right? Um, so when we talk about our partnerships as well, till very recently, uh, you know, I used to be leading the um, ISV and platform partnership for success factors within SAP. I'm in between roles right now within SAP. Uh, but, but what I always, um, you know, experienced was that either there are people who are very good at sales and biz dev and biz dev from a sales standpoint and go to market people, or they're really good technology people and good people who understand the product and the integration layers and, you know, all these things that we talk about. But there are very few people who work at the intersection and can talk to each other. And why I think it is important is that ultimately we are in the business of making money and we'll only make money if our customers are happy, right? Mm -hmm. And the customer, the user, um, so to speak, is really transforming right now as well, right? And, and um, there are functional, you, you know, I mean, I don't wanna get into the wholesale spiel here, but there are buying centers that we sell into. We are talking to these CIOs and that intersection of technology and product is really important. And to be able to make our customers happy in the cloud world, right, which, which we are all in, it is important that the customers get a streamlined experience. They do not care if this product is like coming from SAP. Uh, you know, we have different solutions, right? That are still not integrated to each other. I mean, it's, not, it's common knowledge, so I'm, I'm okay. I mean, we're definitely on a path there. 
but it is very important to me, integration as a topic is very important to me, more so from a customer standpoint, that whether it is a partner integration or our own solution integration, the customer you, you know, has every right to get a streamlined experience, have a common data model that they can work with, and uh, experience. So I think some of it, uh, some of my thoughts on these topic are not just, you know, product technology related, but also come from a customer standpoint. And I, and I, I think that mm-hmm. all of us uh, need to approach this topic from that standpoint as well. Uh, thanks, Vantana. I think uh, that's a great point about thinking about the customer. So mm-hmm. we talk a little bit more about uh, that. Uh, in our coming slides. Uh, so how do you justify investments in integration, right? I mean, there's always this, uh, pro- as a product owner, you have priorities in terms of to build your product and features and integrations is also important when you look at it from a sales perspective or from a buyer's perspective as, as Vandana mentioned. Uh, so, so there, you need to really think of integration as part of your roadmap. Unless you do that, I think it's it's very hard. So, just to give you a couple of examples, if it if you think about integrations in the right way, you can think about it as something that will lead to revenue. Uh, for example, we did integrations with the CRM and Salesforce put applications on the App Exchange that helped. Uh, you know, not only the integration uh, from the uh, end user experience perspective, but it also helped drive sales and business uh, for for the product company that we did that for. Secondly, another example is user experience. And I think that's where Vandana also mentioned about, you know, how, how it's important to think about user, how they're thinking about a particular application. Everybody loves their user interface and wants everybody to do things within their application interface. But if it's a complex workflow that uh, that the end user has to go through an ATS, for example, a ref check platform, a backend screening platform, and they have to jump from one place to the other to get their work done, uh, every time, uh, then it becomes very hard. So one another example that we did is, is for a big ref check platform while integrating with the ATS, we made sure that the integration is not only on the back end but also on the front end. In the visual interface also, you you can see the statuses in in, in both the platforms. And therefore, uh, the adoption, uh, in fact, they didn't lose the people uh, from their application, but instead more people wanted to use the software because now it's available and it's easy to use uh, and it helps them in the workflow. Uh, Overall, from a product perspective, integrations, when you think about integrations, uh, as you maintain a sharp focus on features and uh, you want to build a lot of integrations, uh, one of the challenges that you think is, am I spreading too thin by by taking on all these integrations and and doing that? And that's where, uh, when we come to the how part of it, we will discuss those uh, details. But... Let me also bring in uh, Katrina and Vandana, maybe starting Vandana uh, on this particular topic. Uh, As product uh, people, or uh, what is your advice that should they set aside budgets, build integrations as a part of their roadmap, or you, you prefer based on your experience, you think that, oh, it's okay to do it whenever uh, a need comes up and you can, somehow make the sale and make the customer happy? No, I think so. There is, this is a tricky one, right? Even though the simple answer or the obvious answer should be that yes, absolutely product teams should set up, set aside budget upfront, right? Uh, because integrations are important. Uh, if uh, you, know, you don't pr- create the right in- integration infrastructure, uh, customers are anyway gonna ask for it and some implementator, implementer or you know, a service integration company, SI, is going to build some custom integration, which is ultimately going to break your own system, right? Uh, you know, integrations, if not built correctly, all of us, our experts here know that they can break, you know, break our um, infrastructure. They provide a lot of load on our own infrastructure, the performance of our own solutions, our meaning the product company solutions. 
can take a big hit, right? If the integration is not done right, apart from, of course, making the customer unhappy. But from a product standpoint, as a product owner, I'm very, if I'm really careful about um, my product, I will absolutely want to provide the right hooks, the right connectors, the right APIs in place or a right a platform with a common data model for others to, you know, um, uh, integrate into my solution. So that is the obvious answer that I do think, you know, product teams should set aside budget because in the long term, it plays out right. Uh, having said that, in the real world, um, I also feel that, you know, there are other priorities that always, always, uh, uh, you know, come into play, uh, you know, they, at the same time, it, you know, product owner might mean, okay, there are only very few customers who are asking for this integration or, you know, integration in this area, let's say a recruiting platform. So I'm okay, let me just build on the, focus on the innovation part right now. Let me build my product more. Uh, um, and then, you know, when a customer asks for it, we'll do something about it, right? So I think that I feel in a realistic world is a constant struggle. Uh, but yes, short answer would be yes, absolutely, they should. Uh, because uh, like I said, if you have to create a scalable platform or a product, um, when you're starting out, that is the right time um, to build this platform. Great, great. Great to know about that perspective that, you know, both things work, but you have to have a fine balance. Mm -hmm. Katrina, your thoughts on this topic? You've been yeah. in the integration world. Uh, well, yeah, I, I agree. You have to have um, budget set aside. What that means, again, is questionable, but um, you definitely have to decide what your path forward is going to be, like your what your integration strategy is going to be, whether you're going to um, try to do it all internally, whether you're going to try and just make the best API and documentation possible so people can do it on their own, or if, you know, you have to decide what your path forward is going to be, and it's not going to cover everybody either. So, um, you know, maybe figure out what your strategy is going to be for 85% of your, your clients um, and be prepared for that. Um, but again, you definitely have to put budget aside because it's going to come up, even if you're just supporting your side of the integration, there's going to be time and money involved in it. So mm -hmm. um, figuring out how you're going to go forward when it does come up is, is very important to then figure out what the money is there. Um, Will contribute to your budget. Cool. Yeah, I think uh, that makes a lot of sense that, you know, maintaining that fine balance, putting it into your roadmap, being ready. Um, and uh, at the same time, uh, you know, there are some aspects that when a customer comes on board or a few customers come on board that you can do. Uh, but I think putting that in the roadmap and thinking about it is quite, uh, is, is, is important. So, Moving along, uh, let's now talk about uh, how to go about achieving scalability. And, uh, and when you talk about achieving scalability, you cannot think about integration as a one-off thing. You, you probably need to think about it as a strategic uh, mm -hmm. investment. Uh, we built uh, quite a few integrations, uh, both for enterprise, customers as well as for a lot of uh, product companies out there. And what we have realized is that having a checklist to, to make these decisions uh, is, is important. Now, of course, the checklist can be quite comprehensive. I just wanted to give you a glimpse of, of what it means. Uh, there are three things that you need to focus on. One is the overall strategy, then the customer specific needs and the technology needs. Uh, when it comes to strategy, I think uh, there are different approaches uh, that will lead to. So one example that, that I can share is we're building uh, an integration for a large uh, learning experience platform. And they wanted to provide uh, integrations with all possible learning management systems out there. However, technically that is very hard to do. So, so what we did was we selected the top eight or 10 uh, players like Workday, Success Factors and so forth to which we will create a seamless experience. That means that experience would be seamless. It, everything that you do on the LMS will, can be done on the LXP platform. Same thing on the LXP platform, you can do it on the LMS. And for the long tail of LMS uh, partners, 
who were also their customers. Many of them were using other LMSs, which were not very popular, but in different geographies, they were. We created a tool set or an integration package that they could write to and they could extend like an SDK, if you will. Uh, and, and, and therefore also provide a seamless experience. So, so it, it took a while to build it, but they had that strategy. And in the end, they were able to support as many LMSs as they, as they potentially could and make their customers uh, happy. Uh, the second important thing, of course, is, is the customers. Like how, how do the customer wants to experience the, the integration? Do they want it file-based? Do they want it very synchronous kind of an experience? When they click something here, it should happen in the other software. Uh, what kind of notifications are needed? Um, and now you need to kind of map the customers together uh, and decide which, is, which kind of customers are you are you going to target from, from your integration perspective? And how do you build a strategy specifically for them? And here again, um, I think one of the examples that, that comes to our mind is uh, we built this for a job board. And one of the things they were losing in terms of competitive advantage was when the job posting would happen somewhere, they wanted their job board to capture it in real time. So, so they wanted integration only for a specific API to be available across all the ATSs. For other deeper integrations, they didn't care. So, so that way their response time goes uh, ahead of other job boards that may be doing the same thing, like getting notified on the job and responding to uh, and sending out the notification to their uh, candidates. So again, understanding the customer is important and therefore the scope of integration becomes important and how to scale that specific aspect. And lastly, technology and technology is also drives a lot of decision-making in terms of how you build uh, your, your integrations. Now in HR, I think we have HR XML as a standard, uh, HROS, uh, and, but the, the, the real challenge is the industry doesn't use most of them and most of the products are not implementing those. So it becomes really a, a challenge for, for product companies, um, either when they are integrating or providing integration frameworks to, to do this, because there's a lot of custom thing that happens. So again, uh, to, to be able to build something that works for everybody is kind of hard. And that's why uh, these three things become important uh, when you when you create your integration uh, uh, checklist and you can define, um, extend these, these are some questions that we have listed here. I'm sure our uh, panelists will also have more thoughts about, you know, more aspects as well as more parameters as well. One more important thing that I wanted to share is we, we have dealt with integrations, we have deployed integrations, um, but very soon when they get used, I think uh, you run into both uh, what strategy you used to develop the integration, whether you did a platform approach or whether you built a point-to-point -point, and then you have to maintain all the point-to-point -point connections. And even if you have a platform, then you know, will the platform people uh, make changes based on how you are wanting your integrations to behave? So all these are important decision-making in terms of your scalability and customer needs. And of course, performance, that's, that's also affects uh, because if you're, only having two or three customers, you don't have too much to worry about. But if you have suddenly thousands of customers and millions of transactions, then suddenly the integration becomes one of your most critical uh, pieces. So on that note, let me bring our panelists once again, and maybe uh, starting with Katrina this time, ask her this question about, you know, most of these integrations we are talking about in a business to business uh, context. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, from a scalability perspective, we always go say that we build the integration, but it, it, when we deploy it to a particular enterprise, it's, it should be there, they who should be worried about how to scale and you know, work with us on, on that whole thing. But what's your thought? I mean, is that, can you, uh, is it okay to work with the enterprise and do that? Or you have to think about it ahead of time? What, what would be, what would work? Yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, uh, integrations are never set it and forget it. I mean, <laughs> like you said, uh, I've heard 40%, 50% of your developer's time can be spent on just maintaining and, and making sure it's continuing to run the way it's supposed to. Um, so they definitely have to worry about scalability. And if you have, it depends on who your target market is too. So if you're targeting, you know, small businesses and you're doing a ton of integrations, you want to make sure that those, those people aren't going to be able to afford to pay big money for, um, you know, custom integration. So you're going to have to have something that's simple, standardized, <laughs> you know, doesn't have to have a lot of caretaking on it. And then um, the enterprise ones are going to be super customized as always. And, uh, you know, it's, it, it's something that you have to be aware of is going to continue to need attention um, for sure. So yeah, you, you can't just set it and walk away. <laughs> Right, then I think, yeah. just, sorry, go ahead, Shrikant. Yeah, go ahead, Vandana, sorry. I was just going to come to you. Oh, no, I, I think I completely agree with Katrina. I think the complexities also arise because like you said, as an example, right, in the SAP world, um, when, when I took over the role of, uh, uh, you know, the Success Factors Partnerships many years ago now, excuse me, there was, we actually had a custom integration team that was there, right? Uh, and like you mentioned, a lot of time was spent on, you know, just maintaining and managing those integrations for the customer. At that time, of course, we were slightly smaller as well, right? But after the acquisition, in fact, the role that I came into was essentially created because now we had a lot of core market partnerships, a lot of integration, and how do we build a program around it and how we kind of scale this, right? Because it was clearly what we had in place as a custom integration professional services team wasn't something that was scalable, right? So therefore, you know, coming back to your questions that you'd laid out, right? What was the strategy, right? We had to take a look at it from a strategic standpoint. What, what do we want to do? Do we want to spend enough time, you know, customizing each and, integration, each and every integration for our customers and for our partners as well? Or do we want to, because in there as well, you know, some partners would be happy, some partners would be unhappy because for some we did productize integrations, for the others we could not, not because uh -huh. we didn't want to, we just didn't have the resources uh, to do that, right? Uh -huh. uh, so then that is how, you know, from a strategic standpoint, so we said that let's take a, take a call and we're going to scale our platform in a way that we will stop doing custom integrations as much as possible, right? We will have, you know, uh, put in place a framework uh, where whether, like Katrina mentioned earlier, whether it comes to our API availabilities, whether it comes to documentation, whether it is comes to the data layer, the platform, if you will, the opening up the platform for our customers and partners. So we started investing in that piece, right? Having said that, in parallel, we continued to work with our customers and our partners, right, on a piecemeal basis as well, right, because it was still a journey. Our platform wasn't ready. Mm -hmm. So till then, we continued to do point-to-point -point integrations. And point-to-point -point integrations are very interesting as well, because I feel, uh, especially smaller partners and smaller organizations really tend to gravitate towards them because they were really fast, right? They, you can get them done. If you haven't, you make a few API calls, connectors, and it's done, boom. It's just that it happens that if uh, that customer has more than one of our solution or more than multiple partner solutions that work with, let's say, success factors. That's when the challenge starts to come in, right? How many point-to-point -point integrations will you have? And, and how many can you manage? So if a customer has multiple partner integrations, let's say, to the same product in, for example, SAP in this case, it absolutely makes sense that they, they are all tied to one common platform, right? Mm -hmm. So it's, it's again that scale that comes into play, right? So um, you have to definitely take that decision of scaling your platform. Uh, and the in the short term, point-to-point -point integrations look very you know, attractive because they're very fast to build even. Uh, and when we had our cloud platform that we launched, uh, certainly, you know, our partners felt that this is much more work to do uh, ahead, of, ahead of time. And even for us internally, just to put that platform was, was additional work. Uh, but in, we have data points internally, which clearly prove our case. You know, the, the strategy that we put in place uh, has worked for us. Uh, for our partners and uh, uh, certainly our customers. So it's it's like, a, I mean, it's always a trade-off. You always have to make those uh, make those decision points, but overall, I think a platform approach, I, I would certainly say 
if you're looking at growing, if you're a growth company and you're growing, invest early in uh, building a platform. Uh, point-to-point integrations can be very attractive, uh, but maybe not for the long term. Right. Agreed. Yeah. yeah, those are those are great points, and I think uh, uh, while you're saying that you know, point-to-point also works and it's easy for adoption. Uh, there is at some point that you have to switch that strategy to, to a more platform-based approach. Only then uh, you will be able to scale. And I think uh-huh. it's good to know that a company like SAP also struggled to build a platform and it's only a period of time that uh, you know you were able to build it. It's, it's not like uh, you have all the engineering talent and every resource available so you can build something uh, very quickly, but but it takes time. And uh, eventually you get there, customers are happy, your partners are also mm-hmm. happy uh, of, of doing that. Moving on to our uh, final section, which is about you know the, taking the platform approach uh, for integrations and what, what are the options uh, out there. Uh, and we have laid out uh, three approaches that we have seen to work. In, in, in and different companies adopting to different ways of doing it. Um, one is uh, the first one, of course, is is a license-based approach where uh, you there is an intermediary uh, doing uh, platform integrations and they have a, a complete suite of connectors available using which you can connect various apps uh, together. And uh, if if you have uh, typically very high volume and you're integrating across various platforms, you're integrating across the organization, you, you probably will benefit in that uh, investment. Um, and I think uh, there's, I've just listed a couple of them, Cycler and Workalder, but I'm sure there are many more like Mulesoft, Del um, and to the like. So the choice is not easy, but I think uh, the options are there. So mm-hmm. if you got your strategy right, if you if you know what you're targeting, uh, you can potentially leverage uh, that uh, that approach. The second approach that we have seen in the market uh, is also look at a platform approach, but look at an open source approach uh, where you you get the uh, benefits of using a platform, uh, but at the same time, um, if you're worried about big licensing fees and whether your customers will be okay with a particular platform that you license, you can you can go for an open source uh, approach. Again, here you can probably support a very large volume of transactions, but uh, those of those things you may have to work with a vendor to to make sure that it really works and performs to the way uh, you want it to. So whatever is there right off the box probably uh, may not uh, work very well for you. And third approach is to build. Now in build, you could do a point-to-point approach or you could do an entire Microsoft or my, microservice uh, or an ESB-based approach. You could, you could build it. Um, if you have very custom requirements in, in how your customers are looking at your integrations or you want to have your own mechanism of licensing your APIs and controlling everything that happens, uh, access to your platform, then then building a platform um, uh, of your own is probably a good choice uh, if you're at that scale and level. Um, Of course, you will need a lot of support from your IT team to to build that. And it's uh, probably like what Vandana said, a long journey to kind of build it. But once you have it, then, you know, it eases off many things in terms of how you're partners are connecting with your platform, how your customers are experiencing your software, and it's all kind of part of your uh, offering. Again, these are three approaches. Uh, none of them is kind of, uh, doesn't seem like uh, it's, it's uh, applicable to everyone based on where you are in your journey and what you have a vision for your platform. I think the choice uh, needs to be made. and. Uh, I think on that note, I want to bring uh, both of you, Katrina and uh, Vandana on this topic saying that over the last four or five years, uh, you've seen uh, the integration space evolve. What what type, if, if somebody was there in the audience thinking, where should I start and what should be 
the choice. Oh, what have you encountered most? And you know, what would you say that were the pros and cons of what you what you've seen out there? So starting with Vandana. Oh, thanks. Uh, so I think it's a little bit of a mix, right? Everywhere, but and depends on the size of the company as well. Right. Um, if you're really starting out, right, and you don't have um, not even an engineering talent or don't have enough resources or really struggling with your strategy right now, I would say taking the middleware approach uh, isn't a bad one, right? Because you get something that's already available. Um, you know, somebody else has done the thinking for you, and you just bring in a middleware and, you know, tie it. And it's, in my experience, I think things they work okay, right? Having said that, you know, um, I think as you grow, as you and a build is something that at least I'm not a big proponent of, right? Um, uh, but unless, like, uh, let's say, uh, let me step back actually. So sorry. Uh, so I think uh, let's say if it, if your size, if you're the scale of SAP, right, um, or even smaller, slightly smaller, but you're a large organization. Uh, then, of course, it is important for you to take a platform approach and build a platform, right? For, I mean, invest your resources to build a platform, whether you're a customer or a provider, in fact, right? Mm -hmm. um, to build a platform where anything that you buy, like if you're a customer or any, if you're a product company, anything that you build into, you know, or integrate into can leverage the same layer, right? And so there is definitely merit in building that platform uh, for the reasons that we've discussed, right? Because I think you have more ownership, once you have more ownership of your platform, you have more flexibility to tailor it to your needs as well. I know these sounds like very simple, you know, sentences, but uh, but it does make a difference when you, when you own the platform and you, you drive what you want, your partner's um, to integrate into. And it actually makes the life of your partners easier as well, right? Because you have, a, a, like Katrina mentioned, standard documentation that's available. All partners are approaching it in the same way. Your systems don't get broken that often. And then therefore the customer is happy, right? And similarly, if, you, if you're, on, you're building it for your in-house team, like you mentioned, the build concept, right? Where your IT organization is, is building it for you. I think the same thing applies. Uh, I just feel that um, taking taking um, middleware approach at the start is not that bad. I, I, I think it's it's definitely an easy way to do it. In fact, a lot of our partners have taken that approach. And now we have some really, like the names that you mentioned, these are very evolved uh, providers. They're not like uh, earlier where uh, you know everybody was just struggling. Everybody called themselves a... Uh, um, infrastructure platform as a service or, you know, there were different terms that were bandied about, but I think wow. now um, the middleware industry, so to speak, is also evolving. Uh, I, I'm sure some of you are better experts at that than I am, in fact. Uh, but on the open source, um, I actually have very limited inputs there. Um, I, I wouldn't be able to comment. I'm not an expert, but definitely start with, uh, start with um, the middleware. It's not a bad idea. Cool. Yeah, that's a that's a good uh, point uh, that you mentioned. That you know, start with middleware. If you if you if you don't know how the whole integration works, you get some things ready made, mm -hmm. and then move uh, to a platform. If I'm building it, if if you really are going to be that big, and you know, cool. Uh, Katrina, any views? Uh, you've been with the platform, so you uh, you have some experience firsthand yeah. there. I've worked yeah. with different. Yeah. I'll, um couple of actually all of the different <laughs> ways you can go and I guess the biggest point that I would make is that you're never going to answer everybody's problem with one solution so what you really want to do is just you know find a way to solve for most of your market um, I think going with a platform is good to start with because you can get you know past that question of can you integrate with xyz you know as an isv you want to be able to say yes to that um, and then down the road when you have people that are coming on board and they want custom integrations you might have to either bring someone in to build customization on your platform connector or you know build something completely separate for that that particular client the enterprise client because in a lot of cases they have bought the fancy software because they wanted to customize it and they mm. want to make sure that those customizations you know flow through their other systems so 
um, yeah, you, you're not going to solve everyone's problem with one one answer. So the best you can do is answer most, <laughs> really. Well, yeah, th those are, I think, uh, interesting points that you make. Uh, even when you, you have a platform and you make a choice, there may be use cases that the platform doesn't support. So maybe mm -hmm. you need to probably understand whether it works for your specific use case or you have to anyway custom make that. So, so you want to you know, decide whether which platform to choose also or mm -hmm. how much of customization is actually going to cost you. So mm -hmm. that's going to bring you that uh, advantage. Mm -hmm. yeah. that, uh, thanks for sharing those views. Uh, moving on to um, our uh, last section of uh, today's uh, topic was finally to give you a summary of the key takeaways. So what did we talk about? Um, so most importantly, I think uh, from a integration standpoint and in integration strategy standpoint, because the SaaS ecosystem is so complex, there is there are a lot of softwares that are used together to complete a particular workflow, be it HR, be it recruitment, be it uh, time and attendance. And there are, so integration is, is inherent and that's what the customers are expecting. And, and customers also expect rapid implementation. So, so you could, uh, you have to have some sort of a strategy in place of how you're going to deal with those expectations. So not having an integration strategy, not having a plan of how you're going to do that is going to probably affect uh, your, your product sales. Mm -hmm. um, secondly, when you think about integrations, you have to think about uh, them in a scalable fashion. So because when you think about it in that fashion, you can drive top line growth, you can build more streamlined workflows. And uh, lastly, also take care of, you know, having very fast uh, implementations. And uh, otherwise, when you acquire a customer, just because the integration is not ready, instead of uh, you getting to revenue in a month, it can take four months. So, so something for, for you to uh, think about. And uh, finally, think about in terms of uh, having checklists, uh, like how you have product strategy, um, you know, reasons for choosing uh, features when they come into your product, what, why would they, why are they important? Similarly for integrations, build a checklist uh, that, that has aspects of strategy, customer and technology, uh, go through that questionnaire, uh, go through that in depth, create it for yourself or your product, and I'm sure then the decision making uh, of how you're going to do, what you're going to select as your as your approach for integration, whether you're going to go for licensing something, whether you're going to open source, uh, do do that do it that way, or build something in future, either point to point or like an entire platform uh, for supporting your uh, partners and customers. Uh, you will have a more uh, guided choice. So so on that note. Uh, I think uh, we have had a great discussion here and uh, I would like to, uh, you know, quickly tell you about uh, Harbinger as well uh, before we get into the Q&A section. We are a product engineering and a data engineering company uh, primarily focused on uh, helping most of the product companies uh, build their products and features. And over the last four or five years, um, as Gartner has said, almost 40 to 50% of our work has been on the integration side because that's where, you know, people look at uh, coming to a partner and the experience of how things work, how APIs uh, are, are there across softwares and how, how things really, uh, how they need to approach their whole integration strategy. That's where um, oh, we have been fairly successful and we have a consulting approach towards it. So it's not like a uh, one uh, approach that works for everybody. We understand the product and then try to recommend uh, the strategy um, uh, rather than, you know, one size uh, fits all sort of, a, sort, of, sort of an approach. So, so again, um, opening it up for questions uh, to, to the audience. Thanks once again, Katrina and Vandana for, you know, for your valuable inputs and, uh, you know, we can take a, uh, Questions now. Let me see if there's anything on the chat. Uh, Actually, Jason brought up some interesting.
questions around integration approaches and what works. Um, it's a pretty lengthy section. Maybe <laughs> you want to just speak up, Jason, and sure. reiterate. Sure. Didn't mean to write a book. <laughs> I, I, you know, so yeah. I'm uh, sort of uh, preface this. You know, we, we, uh, I work at a firm that happens to not be a platform, uh, but we, we integrate with a lot of the platforms, and I have a lot of peers in the space that that I um, you know I benchmark with, and I think the interesting thing is. You know, a lot of the advice you gave is great if I'm thinking of a world where I have to connect to the core systems uh, as my, you know, my ability to serve the customers I want to go after, right? Because they have a, a SAP and Oracle Workday. What's interesting is to deliver a lot of the value I think vendors want to deliver today, you, there's this increased burden to actually connect cross second tier. So I may be connected to success factors, but then the, the customer has a chat bot, the customer has a video interview platform. Depending on their relationship with success factors, they may or not be deeply integrated. And if I want to really provide value as a point solution in a complicated stack, it just doesn't work anymore. So if, if they don't have a good, good integration, not because success factors didn't do a good job to provide the APIs, but because they don't have the quality of team or the, the integration, I now have an increased burden to deliver that value. So just it's the cost falls on me if I want to do a good job. Um, it's just an interesting challenge, I think, in that second tier market, um, especially with everybody kind of getting into everybody else's business. So just, just curious for feedback on that. Uh, what are any thoughts you have on that? Uh, uh, I, I can just say Jason couldn't agree more, uh, <laughs> but I, I think I have one or two opinions, right? Of course, one is the SAP view, right? Because I represent SAP here. Um, I, I will say that that is why, you know, over the years when we grew our ecosystem, our objective was to also sift it through for our, uh, all the innovation that's happening out there, right? 3,000, 4,000 HR tech players that are there right now. Um, to bring and curate sort of sort of the key ones for our uh, customers, right? Because it wasn't like you mentioned, there are just too many players out there and great innovation happening actually, but our customers said now how, I mean, um, we cannot possibly go through 4,000, list of 4,000 players out there and pick which one, you know, which video recruiting vendor should I go with, right? And that was, a, even though, you know, you, there are two, two sides to the coin, of course, it's not fair to the, smaller players, maybe very smart players who are just starting out. Uh, but we said, okay, why not we start, a, you know, to take an app center approach where, which is a marketplace of, uh, uh, you know, partnerships or uh, vendor solutions so that uh, we were still providing, you know, publicly available APIs and all the information that's out there, but we were mm -hmm. curating. We were not making whatever we put on the app center went through a basic readiness check and we were sort of in our own way saying okay this is our ecosystem these are the partners that recruit, um, integrate with us and therefore within that uh, our ecosystem there that collaboration started as well those uh, partners are typically or vendors are typically integrated between each other as well because they have a common core that they integrate to so you can call them in very loose terms we came in so SAP or success factors shop so now they had the the common layers to kind of uh, integrate with each other right so the customers knew that these set of solutions work together with each other uh, but uh, but then uh, what we also from our very limited point of view um, also tried to do is that it's fair to everybody in the sense that we, we did not want to lose out on the innovation. The good stuff should reach the customers. So if you look at our ecosystem, we tried to work with very small partners, established partners, and very, like small startups, right? So broaden your range as much as possible, but still have that little flexibility on who we want to partner with, uh, right? Uh, but um, still telling the customer, or if you're a third, if you're a vendor, even if you're not our partner, there are APIs available publicly that you can, you know, integrate into our solution, and you won't just be called our partner, right? Um, so we are, as a slightly larger company, of course, it is our responsibility to make it easy for you as well to to integrate into us uh, if the customer asks for it because customers came. So there's no easy answer, Jason, but I, I hear what you're saying. Uh, but then that is why I think at, at your level as well, you will need to make those decisions, right? Which, which solutions do you want to, you know, integrate into? And I think Srikanth also mentioned, you know, I think that's a 
probably an HR tech industry uh, problem to solve for, right? Having common standards, right? Or uh, if bringing together of, you know, meeting of the minds where we can have a network of, uh, you know, our common standards that the solutions are built on and which are easy to integrate with each other. I know there are several initiatives like that in the market, yeah. Uh, but yeah, sorry, I know I, um, no, I, I question I made a long answer as well. It's a great answer. Actually, I mean, SA, SAP, to be clear, is not the problem. You, you, you guys have <laughs> probably the most uh, open approach in the market. It's that every core system has a different approach, and most of them are very limiting. So once you figure out your playbook for SAP, it doesn't necessarily translate to Oracle, to Workday, to uh, all these others, right? So it, it's just an interesting, it's almost like, you know, the, the expression is like, innovate or die. It's almost like integrate or die, because if you can't get over that hurdle it, as a mid-tier vendor you're you're just not going to make it because clients are going to ask you to integrate to these systems right so yeah they're gonna yeah that's the first question they ask when you're <laughs> trying to sell your product is do you integrate with my xyz and you're just going to have to figure out you know what who is strategically the best person to put the time and money and effort into and then for the rest just have really good api documentation and you know do everything you can to make those people, <laughs> to put it into their hands, give them all the stuff that they can, they can use to, uh, to solve their own problem. But, uh, you know, if you find really good partners that are on the same page as you and, and just really, you know, go to market and collaborate with a couple of really good ones, it could be worth it, you know. That's all you might need to be successful. Yeah. Yeah, Katrina, uh, great. Uh great point uh, i think you and vandana probably addressed it and yeah it's always a challenge because how many platforms do you integrate to and so there has to be something that you integrate to and some you say that okay uh, here is our api and this is how you will, you can um, you can integrate to that so building your side of the api also mm -hmm. is kind of equally important as we uh, um, allow people to customize and build on top of it so uh, mm -hmm. so yeah uh, jason i hope uh, you you got some answers there and uh, if not i mean we can continue the discussion on another session um, about how to do that uh, anyone else has any other questions i have a question hopefully my microphone's not being a problem i've been told it might be um, i'm wondering if um, what your thoughts would be on Zapier? Um, incredible valuation, very simplistic integrations. I, is that uh, a sign of the future, or is that something that's never going to get beyond simplistic integrations? I can answer that one if you want. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. So. Uh, Zapier is built for the end user, for the employer organization, and not for SaaS vendors, really. Um, if I was a SaaS vendor, I really would prefer not to send my clients or prospects over to a platform where they're going to show up right next to all of their closest competitors. In my yeah, humble that, opinion. <laughs> that, that's something I missed out in the checklist. I think... Uh, there is a distinction. If you are a SaaS vendor, then uh, then which of these platforms probably makes sense? And if you are an enterprise, uh, then there are certain uh, platforms that are better integration platforms for you. So if you uh, probably Zapier happens to be good for end users if they are thinking about their integration. But as SaaS vendors, if you're looking at Zapier, probably it's, uh, you need to double check whether it solves all your needs. Right. They're usually, there's not a lot of customization on those, on that platform or platforms like it. And again, you don't control, you're sending the prospect or customer to somebody else's site. Um, and if the Zapier, or Zapier, excuse me, um, connector for your platform and, you know, your five closest enemies is right there, that means it's pretty easy for them to connect to any of those as well. <laughs> so... Yeah, no, I'm, I'm, I'm saying that it's not, it's not ready for prime time. I'm wondering if it's a different paradigm that can grow, like a innovator's dilemma. I mean, does it have some kind of promise, uh, not, 
yeah, it's not ready today. But it looks like it's different to me, but I haven't spent as much time in the API integration world as the panelists have. So, I mean, I don't know. Is it is it really a different thing? Or is it, is it more the same old, same old and not that innovative? Lloyd, Lloyd let me add, add something for the panel with along with your question there. And that is, is what is the element of, of that expertise for domain? So HR is different. Mm -hmm. Okay, mm. so uh, my expertise taking the best of these uh, iPass solutions without the domain expertise, will anything get done to the panel? I mean, in general, from a developer's perspective, if it's in the API, they can connect it. That doesn't mean they understand why you're moving the data, <laughs> where you're moving it. So... I'm sorry, she can't go ahead. <laughs> no, right. Yeah, so to, uh, yeah, I think Vadana has to leave. Uh, Vadana, thank you for for your participation. I think we're just uh, two minutes away. So yeah, I'm so sorry. Yeah, I don't want didn't want to like leave right in the middle of a question. <laughs> but I really do have to, you know, be on this call uh, very quickly. So thank you so much. Thank you, Vandana. Thank you. Thank you, Vandana. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And hey, just a quick announcement. So, so yeah, I mean, uh, just to say, uh, I think choosing a platform which has an HR focus uh, probably helps because uh, then the deeper, they provide more workflows, more uh, data exchange uh, uh, parameters and your customers are more happy. Otherwise you, you are left out to build everything on, except it may work for your initial use cases, but as your as your product becomes uh, as as more features in it, suddenly you will uh, discover that the generic platforms uh, don't work anymore. So, uh -huh. so if you're choosing a platform, look at their HR connectors, how deep they go um, before you kind of license and you know start implementing on those. Uh -huh. so that's a, that's a valid point, Larry. Thanks for bringing that up. Again, a great panelist uh, input, and uh, Shukran, thank you for kind of facilitating the conversation, uh, guiding the questions. It was really helpful and instructive, so uh, thank you very much. And thanks to Harbinger, also one of our uh, sponsors for this event, and our panelists, of course, and SAP and Exposure SAS. So thank you, sponsors.